everyone, welcome back to another most amazing video. My name is Kennedy and today we are back again with part two of the top 10 scary real stories that disturbed FBI agents. Let's get started. First up in our number 10 spot is Edmund Kemper. One of the most notorious killers of the 20th century, Kemper was actually one of the first killers to help the FBI figure out the patterns of repeat killers. But I mean, the help he provided was disturbing to say the least. It started with torturing insects, then by the age of 10, he buried his pet cat alive, waited for it to die, then dug it up, decapitated it, and mounted its head on a spike. From there, things got more concerning. By the age of 13, his parents divorced and his mother became his sole parental figure. However, she was an alcoholic who mocked and humiliated him and so their relationship turned into an extremely toxic one. At 14, Kemper ran away from home to try and be with his father but eventually ended up living with his grandparents and that is where things got really bad. At 15, he killed both his grandparents and was arrested for the crime, however due to his age he didn't face any criminal charges. By 1969, on his 21st birthday, he was released on parole against his psychologist's warning and sent to live with his mother. Mother. By 1972, he began seeking out college student victims after fights with his mother, and by 1973, he had taken the lives of eight different women this way, becoming known in the public as the co-ed killer. Finally, in April of 1973, he took his mother's life, the one he always wanted to, and did unspeakable things to her corpse before turning himself in. In the end, Kemper was sentenced to life in prison, despite his request to be tortured to death, and will remain behind bars until his final days. Moving on to number 9, Jose Rodolfo Varel Hernandez. Also sometimes referred to as El Gato, this criminal was one of the newer additions to the FBI's most wanted list, having been added just three years ago in 2020. But he is definitely a terrifying man. A warrant for his arrest was issued back in June of 2018 when El Gato was accused of having involvement with interstate stalking and as well as hiring two men to assassinate a man named Guerrero back in 2013. Allegedly, the two hired men tracked down Guerrero and his wife and attempted to take them down. Guerrero did not make it past the attack, but luckily his wife escaped unharmed. The craziest part of all of this is that allegedly Guerrero's sister, after the attack, took revenge on El Gato by having one of his relatives beheaded, which to me sounds like they might have pissed off the wrong people. For a while, the FBI was not exactly sure where El Gato was hiding, but thankfully as of January of this year, he was finally found in Mexico and put into custody. That being said, it doesn't make his case any less disturbing. Moving on to number 8, Alejandro Castillo. Six years ago, Alejandro Castillo texted his co-worker Sandy Lee, who he had briefly dated prior, saying that he wanted to repay her the money she had loaned him. So under the guise of getting her money back, Lee agreed to meet up with him. But here's where it gets twisty. Castillo had a new girlfriend at the time, named Amia Feaster, and the afternoon of the incident, he was picked up by her and she drove the pair to meet up with Lee. Although the full details of the crime aren't confirmed, it's believed Castillo, instead of giving Lee her money back, held her at gunpoint while forcing her to withdraw all the money she had from a nearby ATM, which was about $1,000. Investigators think Castillo then drove Lee into the woods and took her life before dumping the body into a ravine. From there, Castillo and his current girlfriend, Feaster, fled in his Toyota Corolla to Mexico. Since then, he hasn't been seen, but his girlfriend turned herself in in 2016, confirming they had been living with Castillo's cousins when they were in hiding. The FBI hasn't been able to track him down just yet, but they do think he remains hiding in Mexico to this day. Next up at number 7, Arnaldo Jimenez. Most people have a romantic honeymoon, at least that is sort of the assumption, but Mr. Arnaldo Jimenez here seemed to have a different plan in mind. Back in 2012, the day after marrying his wife, who to make matters worse, he already had a family with, Jimenez took her out with some friends to a club. 
apparently the couple left around 4 a.m. from the club and from there, for whatever reason, he took her life. His wife was stabbed to death in the back of his car before being dragged into the bathroom tub of her apartment and abandoned. Obviously this creep was charged and a warrant went out for his arrest and although authorities have reason to believe he may have fled back to Mexico, they haven't actually been able to track him down. To this day, he remains on the FBI's most wanted with a $250,000 reward for his capture. Next up at number 6, Adolf Coors III. On February 9th, 1960, a milkman sounded his horn several times in an attempt to get the attention of a station wagon that was blocking the middle of a bridge. But when there was no response, he got out of his truck and walked to the vehicle. But it was empty. This was strange, he thought, since its engine was running running and the radio was playing, so after moving the car himself, he reported the matter to local police, who quickly determined that the car belonged to Adolf Coors III. Heir to the Coors Brewing Company fortune, Coors had left his house not far from the bridge that morning, but had not been seen since. 24 hours into the investigation, the FBI entered the case, and good thing too, because that afternoon, Coors's wife Mary received a note demanding ransom for the return of her husband. The the investigation continued with nearly 23 agents on the case, but sadly, despite payment, his body was found on September 11, 1960 in a remote area in Douglas County, Colorado. The man responsible was Joseph Corbett Jr., who had fled to Canada, but was eventually caught and sentenced to prison, where he ultimately died. Coming in at number 5, Scott Armstrong. In the early to mid 2000s, Scott Armstrong was a special FBI agent who had recently become a member of the Cyber Crimes Task Force at the Boone County Sheriff's Department. And he had a very important job to do there to protect vulnerable members of society from illicit photography. So you can imagine other FBI agents' shock when Armstrong soon found himself in an arraignment for third degree assault on one of these vulnerable members who it was his job to protect. According to the Callaway County Police Department, the incident occurred at Armstrong's residence at around midnight on March 1st, 2014. And Armstrong was accused of putting a boy in a chokehold that ended up with him losing consciousness. The boy's parents later took photos of their son's neck, which had signs of being choked, including redness and fabric patterns. While Armstrong pleaded not guilty to the accusation, he admitted he'd placed his arm around the victim's neck until he passed out, which, I mean, to me, sounds like the same thing. However, what was never explained in the report is why the boy was at Armstrong's residence in the first place. And even worse, Armstrong was only sentenced to one year probation, mandated to complete 25 hours of community service, and fined $325.39. Moving on to number four, Patty Hearst. Referred to by the FBI as the strangest case in their history, Patty Hearst was an heiress to the Hearst Publishing Fortune. In 1974, at 19 years old, she was kidnapped from her apartment she shared with her fiance by a group called the Symbionese. Liberation Army. Now, the Symbionese Liberation Army, or SLA, was the first left wing terror group in the USA, and they chose Patty to leverage the Hearst family's political influence to free two SLA members who had been arrested in 1973. In the subsequent 19 months, Hearst was severely harmed but began to align with the SLA, participating in their crimes, including making weapons and a bank robbery, and was eventually arrested with other other members of the SLA and charged with the crimes she participated in. Upon her arrest, Hearst shared the horrors that had happened to her while a prisoner, claiming to have been a victim of Stockholm Syndrome. But despite the controversial circumstances, she was convicted of bank robbery and sentenced to prison. That being said, in 1979, President Jimmy Carter commuted her sentence to time served, and in 2001, she was pardoned by President Bill Clinton. Coming in at number three. Gary Ridgway. Another disturbing case for the FBI, Gary grew up in a troubled household with very little stability, which led to him wetting his bed well into his teen years. After each incident, his mother would clean him up, which led Gary to have 
conflicting feelings of both anger and desire towards his mother, often fantasizing about killing her and doing awful things to her. When he got older, he joined the military, and although he was married, he started to become obsessed with escorts. But once he returned back to America, his marriage ended quickly after his wife discovered he had given her multiple infections. Soon he married again, however, this time finding salvation in the church. He forced his wife into a staunch and devout life, but in contrast, kept his ravenous appetite for inappropriate relations both with his wife and with those whose company he paid for. But Ridgway had an inner conflict about his desires, and started strangling the women after he had got what he wanted, then dumped their brutalized bodies into the woods. Disgustingly, it was later revealed by one of his wives that he would often ask to have relations in the woods. At the time, she didn't know why, but during investigations, multiple of his victims were found in those woods, and authorities believe he got pleasure from being in the area. Upon his arrest, he was officially convicted for taking 49 lives, but during trial, he famously said he had killed so many that he lost count, and that even he didn't know the real number anymore. Thankfully, the monster was sentenced to life in prison, but I can imagine it's one of the creepier cases agents have had to deal with. Coming in at number 2, Rodney Alcala. During the late 70s, Rodney came into the public eye after appearing on the TV show The Dating Game, but what America didn't know yet was that he was actually a cold-blooded killer. It's kind of wild that he managed to get on the show in the first place because he already had a pretty hefty criminal history, having already been one of America's most wanted fugitives for several kidnappings of girls, as well as a few suspected killings, but I guess they just didn't do much of a background check on the contestants. At the time, fellow contestants thought he was very strange and creepy, but still, he won the competition and a date with the bachelorette. However, she too felt something was wrong with him and refused to go on a date, which authorities believe was what might have thrown Rodney over the edge. He began kidnapping at a much higher rate, inviting unsuspecting girls and boys to his house to model for him. Once he got them to his house, he would take them into his photo room and forced them to take photos before taking advantage of them and ending their lives. Finally, authorities caught on to him, and upon his 1979 arrest, police uncovered more than a thousand photographs, linking him to a suspected 130 victims. Officially, he was convicted for eight killings and sentenced to death, but died of natural causes before the day came. And last up in our number one spot, Mississippi Burning. In 1964, during the Freedom Summer in America, three civil rights workers, James Cheney, Andrew Goodman, and Michael Schwerner, were working to register black voters in what was at the time a deeply segregated and racially hostile state, overrun with members of the evil pointy hat community. But during their campaign, the men were arrested for speeding. They were detained for a few hours, but eventually released. However, before leaving the county, their car was again pulled over, and the three men were abducted, driven to another location, and shot dead. Initially a missing persons case, the FBI was called in to investigate the disappearance of these men, but sadly after seven weeks of searching, their bodies were discovered buried in a ditch. During the investigation, it emerged that members of the local white racist group, the Neshoba County Sheriff's Office, and the Philadelphia Police Department were involved in the incident. It was a truly disgusting and outrageous case filled with corruption and evil. But outrage over the activists' disappearance helped gain passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Well, that's all I got for you today, friends. I hope you liked this video. If you did, make sure to hit that subscribe button and let me know down below which one of these cases you found the most disturbing. I'll see you next time.